All right, so um, before we start, um, we're going to be talking a lot about megapascals in the course of the lectures. And so it's kind of nice to have an idea physically how, you know, what's a megapascal or what's a, you know, what are these um, stresses um, like. So, you know, when you rip a piece of paper, have you ever thought about how, how strong this is, you know, in terms of megapascal? Actually, it takes a lot to, to rip a paper this way. I, I wouldn't be able to do it. But uh, paper strength is kind of in the area of megapascals. That's the kind of strength you're looking at. With, with steels, it's a lot stronger, yes? Uh, and uh, I have a piece, couple of pieces of steel here. And either one of them, I can't pull them apart. But they're very different in... Uh, in strength properties and in particular um, so you can't really test intention by yourself you know even if it's only megapascal you know piece of paper you would have actually a hard time ripping it apart in, in tension uh, but you can always you know and we know this you can have an idea of the strength by just ripping it you know paper is easy to rip steel is lots, lots harder to rip um, it, it's related, to, and, and you know, when you bend, it's it's more related to um, uh, what we call elastic collapse. But it gives you an idea of this, you know the strength, this, the kind of strength. So so I have here uh, two pieces of steel, and um, uh, the same thickness actually. Yes, and I'm going to ask uh, a lady to come forward. But oh, there's only one, so you will come forward, and you're going to test this for us in bending. You're going to take this. In, in your fingers, you could bend it and see if you can bend them. So, yeah, go ahead. So that's kind of easy, right? No, no problem. So th this would be steel that's got like a strength of order of few hundred megapascal, right? So now you're going to try to do the same thing with this bar, and it's a lot. Yeah, you can bend it, but it's just elastically, and it just. So and 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 here you're looking at something at 1500. So that. Uh, uh, ten make ten times difference, yeah, and you can really feel the difference, yeah. Even though you are, uh, you, you know, it would be impossible to put, you know test it this way, which kind of gives you a good feeling. So I'm gonna, let, you know, everybody can have a look for themselves. Just bend in between your fingers because you know obviously if you know some of you are very strong, I don't doubt it. Uh, so just just bend into your fingers and just have a feeling of how easy one is to bend the other one. And, um, uh, and of course, the very strong men don't break them because uh, I'd like to use them next year, perhaps. All right, so, um, so that gives you kind of an idea of, uh, again, you're not testing the tensile strength, all right? Because you're bending the material. Yeah? And you're basically, uh, they're, they're collapsing, right? Uh, but it gives you an idea of, of you know, the, you know, if you were to do test with, you know, with your uh, own muscle power, what what a few uh, megapascals are, uh, what a material is, uh, what a few hundred uh, megapascal you can bend that you can still bend this with your muscle, you know, thousand over a thousand, fifteen hundred. That becomes really hard to do it. Uh, um, Good. So, so um, we were um, uh, we closed the uh, last lecture by saying, well, um, it it, um, it is some interesting uh, things to say about uh, elastic properties is that in in some a subtle way they're related also to plasticity, mm -hmm. and and we said that um, in particular the ratio of bulk to shear modulus was was a uh, or the uh, um, uh, Poisson uh, ratio uh, could tell you something about, uh, could, could be used as a predictor for plasticity um, in the sense of whether a material is going to be brittle or ductile uh, because the, 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 you know, the bulk modulus is related to the, 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 the resistance to fracture, yes? And um, the shear modulus 
is related to how easy it is to shear uh, a crystal. Hmm? And so if a material has a high, high resistance to fracture, i.e. a high bulk modulus, yes, and a low value of the shear modulus, i.e. it's easy to deform the materials by, by shearing, then uh, the material is much more likely to behave in a ductile manner. And, and we've seen this, if we apply this um, argument to iron, we find that the you know, uh, alpha iron ferrite, this most of our steels, um, are ferritic. Hmm? Um, we find that it's you know, just barely above the brittle line, yes? So, um, obviously, and we know, I mean, we can see from this example, bending this piece of steel, that um, uh, our steels are, are formable, yes? Our, uh, they, they can be brittle. We'll discuss, talk about this in certain conditions, but uh, in general, they're ductile. And, uh, and so, uh, the, uh, and, and very ductile, and um, the reason is, uh, and the reason why it doesn't come out of this analysis is because obviously we're looking only at elastic properties, and, and we should be looking at the properties of the things that cause plastic deformation, and those are the dislocations I already said. So, but before we, um, we go into this, so, and I, I told you there were interesting equations which allowed you to, um, uh, to calculate shear modulus as a function of temperature, as a function of composition, were you to need these uh, 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 values for, for research. Um, in general, um, uh, we can uh, assume yes, uh, an approximation that you can use the uh, isotropic um, Hooke's law to uh, describe elasticity in steels. Um, with averaged values of the modulus, uh, uh, the, the, the elastic modulus, and the shear modulus and Poisson ratio. Hmm? Uh, and I don't know if we had, I think we, we, we hadn't seen this yet, but uh, this is an example where, where you use uh, this uh, well-known uh, Hooke's uh, law in your tensile, uh, we'll be talking lots about uh, tensile uh, curves in this course, and the reason why, uh, as, as, as we'll see, uh, maybe not this lecture, but next lecture, is that the tensile test is uh, a very important test uh, uh, in, when you're doing uh, steel design, and uh, because we'll see that when you take a tensile test, you also, uh, the tensile test also gives you the equivalent stress as a function of the equivalent strain, yes? And the equivalent stress and strain play a central role in materials plasticity. Hmm? And, that's, that's, and when you're taking it, uh, making a tensile test, you automatically, get, you automatically get the equivalent stress versus equivalent strain, okay? But that's, now, now we're just basically looking at the, uh, the elasticity uh, properties of a material. So, so here I have a stress strain curve here. It's from a, a, a steel and um, well you can already see the f our first problem here is that um, and I, I will need to, to, to uh, get a, uh, a modulus in, in, in to plug into my um, uh, Hooke's law here. The, the, here. Hmm. Hooke's law. Um, and um, well, if, to do this, I need to uh, find out uh, where my yield points is, etc. So, um, and, and there is no clear yield point. There is no clear transition from elastic behavior to plastic behavior, right? That's, so, so that's an often encountered problem in, uh, you know, in, in, in practice. You know, when you're dealing with steels, there's no uh, sh sharp uh, yield point. And the reason is, and, and second, the, the modulus uh, can be very variable. You know, if you, uh, if you uh, are, have experienced this already, perhaps, when you, you look at the steel, the, the uh, elastic modulus can vary anywhere from 220 to uh, 190 uh, gigapascal. The reason is, of course, is because you're not measuring a single crystal. There are lots of defects 
in the, the, the structure. In particular, there are dislocations already in the, in the structure. Um, you have grain uh, boundaries, you have a point defects such as vacancies, and all these have an impact on your modulus hmm, that you are actually measuring. And as a consequence, uh, when you're measuring at very, very low strains, yes, and low stresses, yes, um, these defects are already influenced by these very low s uh, stress levels that you are applying. Yeah? In particular, we'll see that it doesn't take much stress to have dislocations move. So even at very low uh, stresses, very low strain, you get phenomena that are called uh, microplasticity. Hmm? There is not, you know, you can't see a, a, a plastic macroscopic plastic deformation that you can measure, yes, but um, it, uh, it already occurs. Right? So that's the reason why we have this, um, many steels we have this uh, continuous change from plasticity to, from elasticity to plasticity hmm? because of uh, microplasticity. So what we do is we take a uh, uh, the, uh, the tangent to our stress strain curve, yes, to define the, uh, the, uh, the modulus, yes. And the other thing we do is if we want to uh, decide uh, where, is, where the yield strength is, we just def uh, uh, take by definition, yes, we just agree that a strain of 0.2% is... Um, 0.2% is the uh, uh, is the uh, elastic strength. So 0.2% or 0 0.002 uh, 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 strength. Okay. All right. So uh, and and that allows me, uh, for instance, uh, in this case, uh, you, you can see the modulus is then. Um, the value I find here uh, divided by uh, this uh, distance here, so it gives me 188 gigapascal. Hmm? It's a kind of low value. Hmm? And, and then I can plug this in here in this equation, assuming that I've also measured the uh, Poisson ratio um, by looking at the, uh, uh, the width strain here. Hmm? And, um, and so I just plug this into my uh, uh, matrix here for the, uh, um, for the um, Hooke's law. And, and, and so this allows me to calculate the strain in the, in the tensile direction and then also the strain, the elastic strains in the two perpendicular directions. So there is elastic strain in one direction is uh, positive and, and contractions in the uh, uh, two other uh, perpendicular directions. Um, so there is volume change in, in elasticity, yes? Uh, there is no volume change. In contrast, there is no volume change in, uh, during plastic deformation, yes? Although that's not 100% correct because when you deforming material plastically, you are introducing dislocations and point defects. And so there is a volume change, but it's, it's extremely small and you don't really need to worry about it uh, unless you very special situations. Um, uh, but, there, but there is a volume change in, in elasticity. Okay, so um, you... Uh, What we are um, going to uh, say now, uh, we're going to go through it relatively quickly and um, only highlight what is important um, to remember. So uh, you know that if you, if you uh, take a stress-strain curve, you can define what's called an engineering stress-strain curve and a, um, a true stress-strain curve. Mm -hmm. And in... in uh, in practice, um, uh, for instance, if you look in catalogs, again, of uh, steel producers, you will find engineering stress-strained curves 
mostly reported because the standards uh, for the uh, steel grades defined the materials properties based on the engineering stress strain curve. Mm -hmm. um, but it, for uh, materials development and when you uh, really want to describe the materials property, you should use the true stress strain curve. And the reason why um, there is a difference between an engineering and a true stress strain curve, that is um, uh, because as we, uh, as, we, as we strain materials, yes, the, uh, say this is a round section, yes, yes. Uh, as we strain materials, the, the stresses, uh, so this is a force and this is an area, the beginning area, this is another force, uh, these values change. In, in particular, the section changes. In the case of an engineering stress strain curve, you assume that there is no change in the cross section, yes? Uh, which is not true. However, that's the way we define most of our engineering properties, mechanical properties, right? So, and, and so obviously, uh, this also implies that uh, whatever you've chosen as a uh, specimen will have an impact on what you report as values. Yeah? Uh, so it's, it's important also th uh, for in standards yeah, uh, related to mechanical properties that the, uh, the specimen Yes, dimensions are, are very well defined, hmm? okay? Be because the properties are related to the specimen, the initial specimen dimensions, hmm? okay? So, um, so when you uh, report uh, engineering properties, you always have to say, you know, what specimens you used. Yes, uh, because the values you report may differ, yes, uh, depending on whether you use a, a European uh, standard specimen, for instance, for uh, flat uh, steel uh, sheet, uh, ESDM, North American uh, sample sizes, or just sample sizes, yes. These are very uh, common uh, uh, values here hmm? for uh, specimen sizes. Hmm? So uh, a stress strain curve, an engineering stress strain curve that is just given just like this is actually meaningless. Yes? Hmm? And uh, so you should we should always give, you know, if you, rep if you yourself are reporting, you should always say the conditions in which they were measured, and so in particular the, the samples you use, yes? Okay. Right. Um, one, one of the interesting things uh, to illustrate that, uh, uh, you know, specimens are important is because um, depending on how you measure the stress strain curve, you may get very different stress strain curves. Yeah? In particular, for instance, um, if, you, if you get your stress strain curve not from a stress, a, a uniaxial ten uh, tension test, but for instance from a bulge test, you can also get stress strain curves from a bulge test, or you can get stress strain curves from torsion tests, yes? Hmm? Um, you get very different uh, results. Hmm? Not so much in um, the data, because you can uh, recalculate, for instance, the test results from a bulge test, 
to a true stress or equivalent stress curve versus true strain or equivalent strain. And, and, and then what you find is that the tensile test the results and the bulge test results, they should be, fall on each other. However, the bulge test has if a very interesting peculiarity is um, you don't get um, necking. There's no way for the material to neck. So instead of having a tense, what you get in a tensile uh, case, uh, uh, it stops at about, and so in this case, about uh, 10, 15 percent of deformation because your sample just necks and breaks. In the case of the bulge test, you can explore a much larger strain range than in the case of the uniaxial test. Yes? Same holds for torsion. Hmm? Torsion, so in, in torsion and in bulge tests, you don't get necking. Hmm? So you get a, a different stress strain curve. In, in particular, you get a much a wider strain range. Yes? So, so for you, uh, for those who are not familiar with the um, uh, the bulge test, so th these are the, the what the samples look like. You basically have a uh, you you um, you have your uh, material is uh, is kept in position by a, a drawing die and by a blank holder. Yes, as a f as a film, as it were, and then you have a punch that presses oil against the, your sheet surface, and it, you know, it becomes a sphere, spherical. Hmm? And eventually, it, you know, it does uh, fracture, hmm? uh, and, 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 but it, it, the strain at which the, uh, uh, the, the strains at which the, uh, the fracture begins, yes, hmm? is, uh, is much, much larger than in the case of um, the uniaxial tensile test. Hmm? Hmm? Okay, right, and, 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 and so what I mean is this diffuse neck that we discussed uh, in the past, yes, this diffuse neck does not occur. Yeah? Now, the occurrence of the uh, diffuse neck is important. Let's, let's talk about it um, for a moment. So when we have, uh, we do a, a uniaxial test, and we start with a, a section, a cross-sectional area, yes? And uh, as we deform the material uh, plastically, in the first stage we have, we have what's called homogeneous strain, and uh, so the material becomes longer, your sample becomes larger, and so because we have um, constant uh, volume, so there is an, uh, no change in volume. If, if your material becomes longer, your cross-section must be reduced, hmm? okay? And uh, what happens is uh, in your sample, you've got uh, two competing uh, things happening. One is the material hardens as you deform it. It becomes, you need more force to deform it. Yes, that's um, uh, one aspect. So you need more force to deform it. The other thing is that um, the um, the section becomes smaller and smaller. So you have these two competing effects. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, uh, at, at one point, hmm, uh, there will be a situation where, because of the reduction in section, yes, the effect of the section reduction will be larger than the, str the effects of the strain hardening, and your material will uh, start to localize, be locally uh, uh, deformed only. So you'll get a what, uh, what we call this necking. This neck will, will form. We'll, just, we'll talk about this mechanically in a moment hmm? uh, and, uh, and we'll say why it happens locally. Hmm? But uh, when, when this happens, 
uh, things change dramatically because whereas you have uniform strain, the material is deforms plastically everywhere. Once you have a, a localization of the strain of the deformation, the other parts of the specimens stop deforming plastically. There's no plastic deformation anymore in, in these sections that are outside the neck area. So the, 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 the plastic strain is fully localized here. Okay. All right, so um, we can express relatively simply uh, the uh, relation between uh, stresses and strains in the engineering approach and stresses and strains in the, in the actual approach, as long as we have homogeneous strain. So uh, let's... let's um, go through these equations because they're, they're important and now we'll be using them in a moment. So what you basically express is, is very simply that there is a um, the volume of your material doesn't change. So the, the original section times the original length is the instantaneous section times the or instantaneous length. Hmm? And, and so I can rewrite this equation by uh, saying that the length over L0, instantaneous length over the initial length is uh, equal to the initial cross-section divided by the instantaneous cross-section. Now, the engineering stress uh, is defined as the force divided by the original uh, section and the uh, engineering strain is the, uh, the elongation that I measure divided by the original elongation. And I can rewrite this as instantaneous length divided by L0 minus 1. In other words, this E plus 1 is uh, this ratio here. Okay. In contrast, the um, uh, true stress is the ratio of the force divided by the instantaneous value of the, uh, the section hmm? and the, uh, the strain is not defined as the uh, delta L over L0 but as the integral of an increment in length divided by the instantaneous length and integrate this. Hmm? So that uh, is very simple, that's the natural log of uh, the ratio of the instantaneous length over the initial length hmm? and if I uh, use uh, this equation here I find that the true strain is equal to the natural log of 1 plus the engineering strain. Hmm? Uh, so that's very nice because um, if I have data engineering uh, strain data I can very simply recalculate yeah, the, uh, the true strain Okay, and I can also calculate the true stress because mm, uh, I, I can calculate the instantaneous section. Mm. Uh, very simply, I use this last equation mm, and I rewrite it as 1 plus E is the uh, uh, exponent of the true strain. Mm. And 1 plus E, you can see from here, 1 plus E was gave me the ratio of the initial section divided by the current uh, section. So this gives me this exponential relation between the initial section and the true strain gives me the, the section. So I can, I can very simply go, uh, me, yeah, one more, yes, very, uh, easily calculate if I have engineering strain, engineering uh, stress, I can recalculate this curve, this engineering stress strain curve to this true strain, stress strain curve. And uh, you know, something interesting happens is that um, uh, whereas the engineering stress strain curve had a maximum, yes, 
the, uh, the true stress strain curve is now uh, a, a continuous curve. Yes? And the, uh, the position of wherever this point of instability was is now not very visible on this curve. Yes? It's somewhere, you know, somewhere here. It's, it, it's not this maximum here. That, that maximum is related to fracture. Okay? And so we'll see in a moment. Uh, all right. right, so just just for your um, uh, um, inf information, just to connect a little bit with what we'll say, what we'll uh, see in the future. When, when you actually um, would look at the, the small crystals in your steel, yes, they don't uh, strain like a little bar, yes, like uh, putty or, you know, uh, uh, that, you, that you pull in one direction and, and then, you know, gets uh, narrow. It's, what, what you see is that the material, the grains slip. There is shearing occurs, in, uh, there is a shear deformation that causes the, uh, the strain. Hmm? So if, if you look at the grain, on, at the grain level, yes, you, you see, you can visually see this, that uh, the grains, part of the grains slip over one another, yes? And as a consequence of this slip, you can see, if you slip the top part with respect to the bottom part over a certain distance, the crystal has become longer. Yeah? The crystal has become longer. Yes? And it's this slipping thing, yeah, this slipping mechanism, that actually gives me plastic deformation. Hmm? All right. Okay. All right, but we'll, we'll continue for a few lectures to one or two lectures to ignore this this crystal bit of the uh, the plastic deformation. Okay, so so now we'll, let's let's have a look at this uh, uh, this this maximum in the in the engineering stress strain curve. Yes, because it's an important um, it's an important point from uh, from a technological point of view hmm? in terms of materials development. So if in the, in the unit actual test, hmm, um, uh, we, the, f the following equation is, is always correct. Hmm? So that means that the, the derivative of uh, true stress to true strain is equal to the derivative of the force over the section, uh, true section, over uh, uh, to, uh, with respect to the, the strength. Hmm? So if I, if I calculate this derivative, uh, this is what you get, yes? Mm -hmm. and, and we can rewrite this, mm -hmm. um, rewrite this thing here, this equation, uh, is a function of, by taking out df, d epsilon. So df, d epsilon is equal to this, these two terms. Mm -hmm. So a times d sigma d epsilon plus f over a d a d epsilon. So um, the derivative, the change of the applied force with the strain as a function of the strain, yes, yes, um, is related to two phenomena, which I already described, yes, two competing phenomena. Mm -hmm. The first factor is that the material will harden or can harden. Mm -hmm. So this d sigma d epsilon, it gives me it's nothing else than saying, well, if this is positive, the material hardens. If it's negative, it's, the material softens with strength. So, so this, this basically tells me what is the material's response to the uh, uh, force. Yeah? And the second for, uh, uh, factor is a reduction in area, area the, the A, D, epsilon, the change of the section with uh, the, the deformation. And in the tensile test, it's, an, it's a negative um, uh, value. Hmm? 
because as I make things longer, they necessarily have to uh, reduce in uh, cross-section due to the, uh, because we have constant volume. Uh, and so when these two factors are equal, uh, the F, the D epsilon is zero, and I, I reach this maximum in the stress-strain curve, basically. So we reach a maximum value, so I can put this equal to zero, and I find this, so this equation. And if I now use the relation between the instantaneous cross-section and the strain, which we just derived, and this, this instantaneous uh, section is the initial section times exponent of minus the true strain, I find a very simple uh, relation for dA, the change of the uh, section with the strain, it's minus A. Yes? And if, and if I plug this in, I find that when F is maximum, the derivative to the stress strain curve at that point is equal to the stress at that point. Okay. Now, uh, this equation, which is called uh, Considere's equation, yes, uh, and is, is a very, in, very fundamental equation because the, the only thing, um, I, I didn't say anything about the way the material strain hardens or anything. I, I didn't, um, it's, it's a pretty, uh, it's, it's just uh, based on, you know, what is this sigma d epsilon, yes, um, in my material, and, and just doing this mathematical derivation and then uh, using a fact, uh, this equation here, which is basically based on uh, uh, no change in volume during plastic deformations. Huh? So, and this is what you get. It, it tells you that material will become uh, plastically unstable when the strain hardening is equal to the stress. Hmm? Okay. Um, you may be familiar with another equation uh, which, which is very popular in introductory uh, materials mechanics courses where uh, they say that you reach the maximum in a stress strain curve, yes, in your engineering stress when the, uh, the strain, uh, there should be an E here, if you, well, if you're writing it down, there should be an E, I'll correct it when I po uh, post it, uh, this slide. The engineering strain is equal to n, and, um, and the way it's usually derived in undergraduate uh, courses is uh, by, by saying, well, we, kn we know what the stress strain, what the equation is for the stress strain relation, yes? Mm -hmm. Namely, the, the stress is uh, a constant times um, strain to certain power n, and n being this um, a factor that we call strain hardening. Yeah? And, and this equation can be normalized and, and have this form, maybe you know this form. Um, uh, so, it's not a good way to look at things. Mm, this this um, approach mm, um, because you it, and it, it's absolutely not universal also in the sense that um, you assume a hardening law yes this this uh, uh, relation here doesn't assume anything about the material's properties yes it doesn't say what you know whether the material uh, hardens or softens or whatever it's just you know, okay. And uh, so the, uh, I'm not saying that uh, this is kind of interesting to use as a hand-waving argument, yes, to say, well, if, you know, if, if something strain hardens, uh, if the n value is higher, you will get more uniform elongation. That's, you know, you, you can say this. But if you're actually w wanting to seriously look at uh, strain uh, hardening and the, uh, inst the moment of instability, Hmm? You, should, you should actually use this considers criterion, yeah. which is illustrated here for a number of uh, uh, steels, 
high strength IF steels, a couple of trip steels, and, and a twip steel here. At this stage, not so important um, what, um, what these uh, grades are. And this is the stress strain curve, the continuous lines, and the dots are the uh, derivative to this continuous line. And you see that um, as I increase the uh, the stress, uh, the, the strain hardening, excuse me, the uniform elongation increases, yes? Because that's, that is uh, this considers criterion. You can also see that the strain hardening, this, this d sigma d epsilon, is not a constant, yes? It depends on the strain, right? Uh, when you assume um, the, an exponential hardening law, like, like the one uh, here, yes, the strain hardening is a constant, yes? It's basically a constant. It's not a function of the strain. All right, so uh, this is the equation you want to use to, uh, to get the... Um, so, but uh, let's have a look now at uh, why it is that um, these exponential strain hardening laws and the, um, the use of this n value, which we'll talk about it in a moment in more detail, uh, why it's such a, um, um, a concept that remains very strong in engineering. Hmm? Well, it turns out that in many cases, uh, and in particular for ferritic steels, when you take your data from a stress-strain curve and you plot the stress and the strain Yes, data, and now you plot them not in a linear way, but you plot them in a log-log plot. Yes, you plot them in a log-log. Then what you very often see is that, for instance here, a low carbon steel, you find a straight line, or very close to a straight line. And this is a ferritic stainless steel, a straight line. Yes? So. It basically means that your, this idea of having an exponential hardening law is, you know, may not be very correct from a uh, fundamental point of view, but in practice it's actually a pretty solid uh, concept to follow because of its simplicity. And so as a consequence, if, if your log-log plots are pretty much straight, that means that your n value, yes, the n value you get from uh, is basically the slope of this stress strain curve, yes? And your n value is, is actually pretty constant as a function of strain. But <coughs> uh, just to illustrate that that's not uh, always correct, you uh, have now here two other steels, an 18 chrome 8% nickel and a 17 chrome 7% nickel, and these are two austenitic steels. And um, there, if you now plot the same, uh, the, the, the stress-strain curves in a log-log plot, you find not a linear behavior. Actually, it's kind of curvy. Yeah? This one curves up. This one also curves up here at larger strains. And if we um, uh, determine the, uh, the slope to these lines, you, we do find that the n value is not constant with strain. And uh, in, in fact, with this 17% uh, chrome, 7% nickel, it even has a big bump in it, right? So obviously, yes, uh, uh, something is happening in these materials, uh, and which makes the use of a simple single parameter to look at the strain hardening a non-working uh, uh, concept in this case. Hmm? 
Okay. So um, right. So so very important. Um, we. Uh, we, we should use the consider criterion to describe plastic instability. Hmm? And this consider criterion is very important because it tells you that the strain hardening, yes, has a big impact on the plastic instability. So th the higher it is, yes, the higher my plastic instability, the higher strains my plastic instabilities will occur at, yes? But it also means that if you can increase the strain hardening, yes, you also increase the strength of a material, right? So strain hardening allows you to, engineering the strain hardening allows you to increase the uniform, the amount of uniform deformation you can give, to, but also increase the strength of a material. So it's a very uh, uh, powerful thing to control. Hmm? if you can control it. Yeah? <coughs> okay, now where do, these, where do this idea come from that you know, um, st strain hardening, you know, strain hardening which is basically d sigma d epsilon, yes? Um, which is like uh, the correct scientific and, uh, uh, way to, to look at strain hardening um, in engineering has, is pretty much um, um, engineering practice uh, is, is pretty much been replaced by an N value yeah? which, which again as I said you know if you look at uh, manufacturing uh, uh, data, uh, catalogs of steels, etc. that's basically what you'll get. They'll say the end value is 0.2 or we guarantee you a value of 0.22. Yeah? And our steel is better because we have 0.23 end value. Yeah? Okay? Um, so, and, well, it, it the, the, the root of this is what we call the conventional stress-strain relationships, yes? So, and uh, these are ways that uh, we're using to represent the stress-strain curve. Hmm? So we have stress-strain data, yes? So you can do two things. You can give this to your customer here. This is the stress-strain curve. Or you can just say, uh, well, uh, use the stress strain curve to, to derive some key parameters of the material. Hmm? So, um, these are, it's an empirical approach. There's no science involved, right? So you can do whatever you want. If you, um, if you have an interesting equation, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, have your own. And there are a couple of um, actually many more than the ones I'm going to show you, but in, uh, in, in, uh, in engineering, uh, the most important ones are, and you probably uh, know them, the one that I already mentioned is the Holloman power law. Uh, so you basically fit your data, you know, however well you can, on this curve here, sigma is A times epsilon to the to the n, hmm? and n is a, and a and n are, are two constants. Hmm? So they're, they're not strain dependent, and you basically fit this to your, to your data. You obviously, um, you already uh, probably feel that uh, knowing that your stress strain curve has like an elastic part and then, and then a, 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 a curved part here, um, it's going to be um, less than perfect to fit the uh, the low the low strain uh, segment and that's true hmm? great deviations are always uh, between you find between the equation and measure data is for low strain values you know where it doesn't really do the job nicely of fitting the elastic part hmm? and the error becomes negligible at larger strains hmm? okay 
uh, of these uh, conventional stress strain, you can, for comparison reasons, you can, uh, uh, you can normalize them. Hmm? So you, di you divide the stress by, by sigma zero and, and epsilon by epsilon zero. We'll, we'll say a few more things about in this in a moment. Okay. Um, obviously, uh, this has been some clever people who've said, well, uh, you know, I, we don't like this behavior very much. Um, we'd like to have another equation which describes um, the plastic part of my uh, stress strain curve. Yeah? And so one of, and, and one of these equations is uh, Ludwig's power law. Yeah? And sigma is the yield strength plus and then it basically looks like the, um, the Holloman equation. It doesn't really look like it, because in this case, your, the strain is not the total strain, yes, but the plastic strain. So you have to remove the uh, elastic strain from your data if you're using this. So, So if you have a stress strain curve, yeah, excuse me, uh, uh, data, yes, like this, yeah, um, and, and you look at any point here, yes, so, so the, the strain here is the total strain, yeah, it's, it's a total strain. So if, if you were to uh, unload this, it would go like this. It would, you would, you would have a, an elastic uh, a, a reduction in the in the length to to the uh, elastic part of the strain. So um, this would be the plastic strain, uh, and this would be the elastic strain. Yeah, and and the elastic strain. So you know that sigma is e times epsilon. So elastic, and, and this is then your sigma here. So the elastic strain is sigma divided by e. Okay, not the yield strength note. Okay, so this this elastic strain changes with the amount of strain you get, right? Because there is another stress. So, but you can you can calculate this, right? If you know the modulus and you know the stress levels, um, so you you can fit your data to the uh, to this equation hmm? what is important is that the n value in this fit yes and the n value you uh, you would obtain by fitting the previous Holloman equation is not the same value right it doesn't you know because it's another fitting procedure uh, in, uh, in, um, in the case of the Ludwig equation, so, uh, so, so if you remember here, for instance, uh, this was our modulus, right? And then we had here 0 0.002 uh, uh, strain, yes? So this was the yield stress. So what, what you do with the, with the Ludwig equation, you, you take this data and then you transform it in the plastic data strain, yes? And, and the equation starts with, at the yield stress, yes? Okay, and that's what you fit to uh, this equation. Hmm? Uh, whereas in the Holloman case, you take all the data and you just fit, right? So the n value is not necessarily the same. So if somebody gives you the n value and doesn't tell you what equation he's fitted it to, yes, you don't really know what it means, right? Okay. Um, now, a, a good one that's used a lot, and um, that's the, 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 the Swift equation. So it looks a little bit like the uh, Ludwig's equation, but it's different. 
Yes. Uh, so, so here you, you don't define, see that the thing with Ludwig, you already defined what the yield strength is, right? Here you kind of keep it open um, and it's k times a plus, again the plastic strain, uh, let me see, yeah, so the Ludwig, excuse me. Right, so this Ludwig, I only have two parameters, a and n, right? In, uh, yeah. in this case here, I have three parameters, k, a, n, which I can fit, right? So it's a little bit more flexible. Hmm? All right, but again, we have an n value, which may not be necessarily the same as in Holloman's case and in the case of um, um, uh, Ludwig, all right? The nice thing about uh, these uh, Swift functions, for instance, is that you can, you can get uh, very clear uh, approximations for calculated approximations for un things like uniform stress, uniform strain. Hmm? For instance, you just basically, um, if you look at the equation, uh, so you find relatively simple formulas so once you have determined what n value is, you can determine the, um, the strain hardening coefficients. Now, the problem with these three approaches, Holloman, Swift, and Ludwig, is that this n value, which may be different in all cases, um, uh, is a constant. So once you've fitted it, it's, it's got a value, and that's it. It doesn't, it's, it's not strain dependent, yes? And so, um, and, and for the obvious reasons that you know some very simple materials will do not have a, a, a constant um, value of n. Um, uh, there's the previous equations implicitly assume that the strain hardening has a single value, and we, you avoid this um, uh, assumption by using this Voce exponential law, yeah? right? And, and the, this is the general uh, view. Um, so, so this is what the equation looks like. Yeah? Um, the, the general form, yes? And, and you see uh, you have parameters A and B, and, and that's it. There is no hardening law in this thing, yes? And uh, you can derive a hardening uh, uh, relation from this just by doing the derivative of the stress to the plastic strain. That will give you uh, a, a variable um, stress strain curve. So it's, it looks a little bit um, trivial, but if, if this equation is uh, your Ludwig equation, and you do the derivative, you will find, uh, so if I, if I do the derivative, uh, the derivative of this equation, it'll be, it'll be flat, it'll be a flat line, yes? The Holloman, it'll be, you know. However, with the Voce equation, yeah, which visually may look rather similar, right? Um, your n value will, will vary, yes? And that's, that's, um, uh, much closer to actual material behavior that uh, some people favor this approach. Technically, it's not being used, okay? So you're not going to find uh, materials descriptions and, and uh, producers catalog with, uh, in any industry which, which actually uh, use this approach. However, uh, in, um, scientifically, it's, it's actually the preferred uh, empirical equation hmm? because you don't assume that the um, okay right hmm? and again um, using this um, this law you, you can you have formulas simple formulas uh, 
based on the, the fitting parameters that allow you to determine the uniform elongation and the uniform, uh, the, the stress at the uniform elongation. Hmm? Okay? And, and here you, you can, uh, you basically compare them hmm? for, for different uh, values here, uh, n values. So in the case of Ludwig, uh, n values uh, are constant, yes? In the case of Voce, they, they're not. Yes, and, um, and, and what's, uh, what uh, the Voce uh, empirical equation gives you is an, this exponential uh, f shape. So there is, a, as it were, an asymptotic uh, stress value. But no, um, the... the, the uh, the n value is not constant. Okay? So um, let's have a look. Uh, this is an IF steel. This is the engineering stress string curve. This is the true stress strain curve. Um, this is just data from a, uh, yes? So what can we do? Uh, well, we just do curve fitting procedure, yes? Um, and uh, we use Ludwig, Swift, and Voice. And you just do a least square fit, right? And this, these are the parameters you find, yeah? Oh, and I see some reason uh, it uh, dropped down here. But anyway, um, uh, let's focus on Ludwig and uh, Swift equations. And, and uh, as I told you, uh, for instance, you look at the n value. Here the n value is 0.55, here the n value is 0.24, yeah? So again, any time somebody gives you an n value, yes, without telling you, um, you know, where it comes from, Swift, Ludwig, or Holloman, meaningless, right? Uh, the one that uh, uh, is actually uh, most used is this equation, so from, you know, technical engineering point of view, that's the one people use, yes? So, although they, you know, you usually left to guess, yeah? That's just it. So, when people tell you, um, typically, um, ferrite uh, strain hardening coefficient, uh, and they say it's 0.22, yes? Or 0.25 in this case, for instance, um, that's what they mean. Hmm? It's usually a swift. Uh, value. Um, right, and then, then I can, um, so um, if, I, if I have K, A, and N, uh, I, 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 what's the uniform elongation here? I don't know, right? So you, but um, you can, uh, using these associated formulas, determine the yield strength the proof strength, so the, the, the yield strength, um, the, proof str the 0 0.2 percent proof strength, excuse me, so the yield strength at 0.2 percent, the ultimate tensile strength, and the uniform elongation, yes? And of course, in this case, yes, because you have, it's, it comes as no surprise that the uniform elongation should be constant, yeah, and as, as equal, uh, is equal to this n value, hmm? or close to this n value, this, this is a, an approximation. Yeah? 0.24. Right. So, um, but but say you're uh, you, you're like uh, like yourself, you're a young researcher. You you know you you'd like to have some equations or guess uh, what um, uh, you know have some real equations, some real data that you could uh, play with. These empirical formulas don't help you at all. You, you, if you don't have data, you know, you can't really uh, do anything much with them. Um, but but for, in, in terms of design purposes. But of course, um, uh, many uh, steel companies and, 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 and researchers have been using um, these SWIFT equations for years, you know. They have a huge databases, yes, yes. And they have determined uh, these three parameters, A, K, and N, for thousands of steels. Hmm? 
So after a while, you're able to uh, set up equations, yes, that are, uh, again, empirical equations, yes, um, which tells you what the value of K, the value of N is for this set of steels that was analyzed over the years, yes? As a function of, and this becomes interesting, as a function of the composition. The silicon, the manganese, the phosphorus, the grain size, whatever parameters they've put in, uh, uh, taken into account uh, when they did the statistical analysis <coughs> of their data. And the end value too. Yes? So this allows you to, you know, um, uh, for instance, um, think about a steel yeah, with a certain composition, with a certain grain diameter. <coughs> if you look at the previous equation, there is a parameter for the amount of carbon in solid solution. So uh, you can take that into account. If the steel is well annealed, that amount is very low, and you can assume it's zero. And then you can basically uh, get your Swift equation, plug in the parameters, and you get a stress strain curve, yes? Uh, and, and here I have added myself, by hand, an elastic part to it, yes? Okay, so, um, and it, the, 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 res the, the results are reasonable. Hmm? And you can say, well, you know, what happens if I change the carbon content, the phosphorus content, uh, and you get, uh, you can get trends, which again, are based on entirely empirical, uh, there's no theory behind it, it's just uh, empirical, uh, an empirical approach, and lots of data analysis. Hmm? Okay. So I have a, a couple of minutes before I uh, close. So, um, but the stress strain curves, uh, as I said, uh, in, in practice, they depend on um, the sample dimensions. They depend on uh, other uh, aspects of the test. And there are two aspects that are extremely important. One is the temperature, yes? And the other aspect is the strain rate, yes? And the strain rate, um, so, so usually from a technical point of view, it's, uh, once you, you want temperature data, it becomes more difficult to get this type of data. But the strain rate data is sometimes uh, or very often available, yes? And um, in order to take the, um, the strain rate into account, yes? we again have uh, conventional uh, equations and, uh, that are extended to take uh, strain rate into account. And the extension of the Holomon equation, you probably know, is uh, by adding, by, by multiplying your Holomon equation with this uh, epsilon dot, the strain rate time to the power m. And this, this factor M is called the um, uh, strain rate uh, sensitivity. Yes? And this uh, parameter, again, the way it's suggested by the Holloman, uh, uh, extended Holloman equation, suggests that it's a constant. Yes? But it's, it's not at all a constant. It's, it's, it's very dependent on the strain rate itself. This is a plot here of the strain rate, uh, strain rate sensitivity as a function of the strain rate, yes? And you can see very, very large variations. Um, usually for ferritic steels, our strain rate sensitivity, this M value, as in, it occurs in this uh, uh, equation here, is 0 0.05, so it's a small value. But you can see that as we reduce the, the strain rate, um, this value can go very high. It can cross, it can be higher than 0.5. At, 
This is data, by the way, at 800 degrees C. And this means that your material can behave super plastically. But I've come to the end of my class and the lecture today, and you'll have to wait till Thursday to hear more about this. Thank you for your attention.